Ready? Ready to go? Okay. Hello everyone, good afternoon. My name is uh, Hans de Goede and I work for Red Hat and for the last six months I've been working on uh, the graphics team, mostly on the input side of things, especially focusing on uh, the new input stack for, uh, for Wayland. So uh, these are the topics I want to talk to you about. Uh, I hope you don't expect to be entertained for the full 45 minutes. I have tried to keep this talk at approximately 30 minutes to leave room for questions and discussion. So if you don't have any questions, then we'll done, be done in 30 minutes, but I hope there will be questions. So let's get started. Um, this talk is mostly about lib input, what we get to later, but let's first see what we had before lib input. In Xorg, in the X, Xorg is the X11 implementation we use on all the free desktops, there is one input stack, which is part of the X server part in external input drivers, but it's all one input stack, independent of if you're running XFCE, KDE, GNOME, Window Maker, FFWM, uh, whatever, TWM, doesn't matter, you all have one input stack. In uh, Wayland, however, what a lot of people don't realize, Wayland is not a display server, like XORG is a display server. Wayland is a protocol and a library to help other applications and servers implement the protocol. Uh, so in Wayland we have a compositor, and the compositor is the display server, which is implemented using partly parts of the library and part custom. Uh, this means that each desktop environment, like uh, GNOME is GNOME Shell, and KDE has KWIM, which are their own compositing managers, now also have their own display server. And as a result of that, so far, uh, each desktop environment has its own input stack. So they're each implementing their own input stack. So we have one, and now we get one per desktop environment. Uh, this is a problem. Why is this a problem? Input is hard. People always think it's a mice, it's a keyboard. How hard can input be? Now really, input is much harder, much more complicated than it seems. Uh, part of it is heuristics, right? You need to guess what the user's intent is, what the user wants to do. But just getting all the details right is already turning out to be a problem with a single input stack in Windows. We've made some mistakes there, which we're carrying forward now for backward compatibility. But in general, various aspects of inputs are just not as easy as you would think when you first think about inputs, and you think it's easy, but it's not. Uh, the conclusion is, is if there are a lot of nitty-gritty details which we need to get right, and also a lot of behaviorals where you can sort of need to pick decent defaults and maybe have some configuration knobs, but not too many, because you want to sort of everything to just work, uh, then having one implementation per compositor is just not a very good idea. Each one will have its own idiocracies, its own tiny little weird behaviors. If the user then switches from one desktop environment to another, he will need to get used to how that can stick. So it's just not a good idea to have multiple input stacks. Enter lib input. Uh, luckily, uh, a number of people who are working on Wayland all agreed on that having multiple input stacks is not a good idea. So we got together and we did lib input. Uh, like Wayland actually is a protocol and a library, lib input is, as the name suggests, a library. Right? It's not a server, it's something which a compositor can use to deal with input and get events which it can then pretty much one-on-one -on -one translate into the Wayland protocol and send to the clients. Uh, an important part for us when we're talking about uh, lib input is that we are starting from scratch. We are not copying any code over from X because that code is old and crusty and has a lot of backward compatibility in it and we won't, don't want to carry that forward. That means that the lib input will not work with the old keyboard and mouse devices. If you have a really ancient kernel which only has the old keyboard and mouse devices, you're out of luck. We want to have EVDEV and only EVDEV. We want to have UDEV, etc. We actually need to have UDEV. If it's not there, this will not work. Uh, we also have no backward compatibility with some of the crazy features or hacks which the X drivers have. In the X driver, you can remap your mouse button in any way possible. 
uh, we won't allow that. We'll probably allow something for left-handed people and that will be it. No more that you can put your mouse upside down and still use it, etc. Uh, we hope to, uh, we are currently at a point where we hope to declare the lib input ABI stable by the next release. A couple of last releases have, we had to have break the ABI because of some API design issues, but we're pretty sure that right now we can set it in stone and then at least for the next year or something keep it unchanged. Uh, other things which are special about lib input are uh, Xorg has a single driver per input device. Right, so you get a structure as a driver from the, from the server which you use to represent a device with. This means that devices are not aware of each other, which leads to ugly hacks. There's this feature called uh, disable while typing, which you can check in your touchpad properties in GNOME, for example. The way that actually works is that if you check that, GNOME starts a little application which listens to keyboard events. And whenever it says sees keyboard events, it sends a disable call to the touchpad. And then when there aren't any keyboard events for a while, it, so we need a separate process, sort of a mini daemon running inside the X server to be able to link a connection between two devices. Uh, Lib input will be able to get rid of that and to uh, actually have links between devices when devices are related to each other and handle all these kind of things without needing a separate helper process. Uh, one of the examples here is that uh, the latest ThinkPad generation, the 40 series, the X240, the 2440, the 2540, and all the other new 40 models, uh, no longer have physical buttons for uh, the track the point. Right? They right now they have, if you look at it, this is, this is an example of it, if you look at this laptop, you see there are no more physical buttons here. So if you use the track point, you are supposed to click on these areas of the touchpad. Uh, that is a problem because trackpoint users typically use something called mouse wheel emulation. What that means is that you click the middle button and then your trackpoint becomes a scroll wheel. So you can scroll through text using your trackpoint. Um, there are two problems with that. In X we have the problem that because X is sort of stupid and doesn't really have any smarts about hot plug, etc. Uh, you need to manually edit your xorg.conf to enable mouse view emulation. Well, it's something which almost every trackpoint user wants to use. Us. So we're going to automatically enable features like this in, uh, in lib input. We're not going to be exporting a config file for this. If you use lib input, you will get mouse view emulation on trackpoints, period, full stop. Uh, but for these laptops where there are no physical buttons, that means that the middle button click gets reported on a touchpad, not to the physical buttons which older ThinkPads have actually are attached to the track point, also physically how it's wired up in the laptop. So right now we need to see that the middle button on the touchpad is clicked and when that happens we need to enable mouse view emulation on a separate device. So again it's advantage for us in lib input that we have all the devices in one library, there's a single contact shared between them and devices can go back to the lib input context and find other sibling devices. And we can do the links there with regard to sibling devices. I already said that but we plan to hide as much as possible uh, from API users but also effectively just from end users configuration knobs. X is full with crazy hacks because we didn't get heuristics right and we just threw up our hands in the air and said Oh, this is hard, we'll just add configuration knob number 17 to stop that user from complaining and he can just create his own very special config. We no longer want to do that, we just want to get things where we have heuristics good enough that it will just work everywhere. Uh, there will still be a configuration API for users of preferences like mouse speed. Uh, mouse speed actually is a problem. Um, not only because different people prefer different mouse speed, but because the USB hit protocol doesn't tell you the resolution of a mouse. If you have a cheap mouse, it's something like 300 mickeys per millimeter. With mouses, we call a single unit of movement a mickey. That sounds silly. Uh, it is silly, we call it that because it has no 
reference. There is no reference in the real world. One mouse does 300 micis a millimeter, another mouse does 1200 micis a millimeter. So it's four times as fast. Unfortunately, the, the great wizards who created the hit standard did not find it necessary to be able to put that information in the descriptors of a mouse. All you get is this is a relative device and it gives you micis along the x axis and the y axis. So for things like mouse speed, we will be able, we will need a configuration knob, but we're really trying to keep this to a minimum. Another problem which XOR drivers have is that they work together with libevdev and the X server, and to be tested, you need a client which connects to the X server, and there are too many moving parts to really create a fully automated test suite. Nothing is impossible, but it's just quite hard with X, so we haven't done that. LibInput, on the other hand, has had an automated test suite from day one. This is really useful because, again, input is hard. If we're talking about touchpads, and most of you will probably just think a touchpad is a touchpad. No, there are single touch touchpads, there are semi-multi-touch touchpads, there are real touchpads, there are multi-touch touchpads, there are clickpads, there are Apple, Apple touchpads, which are special in their own way. A problem of, with all these variants is without a test suite in X, in X we just wing it, we make the change because one touchpad is broken and we hope we don't break all the other times. Here we actually have emulation of the touchpads, we make recordings on real devices and play them back. So a recording for a left click, a recording for a right click, etc. So we can actually hopefully avoid regressions that if we fix something on one type of touchpad we don't break it on another. Uh, since we're putting a lot of work in lib input and since we have some historical mistakes in X we sort of regret. Uh, the plan is for X to also move to lib input. So we really will have one unified input stack for all, for people who are still using X, because XFCE probably won't do it for a while. Uh, it will also be using X or to an input driver, and which just talks directly to lib input. And this gives us almost all the advantages. Uh, when we make this move, probably for the R22, some people will cry, because, as I said, one sheet back. Two sheet back, no backwards compatibility with some of the crazy features XORG has. So if you have a very special custom XORG.conf to make the right half of your trackpad behave differently from your left half, you lose. You're going to lose that in Fedora 22. Mm, unless maybe you manually still install the old drivers, but the default setup won't support these kinds of crazy stuff. So let's look at different type of input devices and how they're handled in lib input and in general. Getting raw codes from keyboard is easy. Ah, something is easy with input. Uh, a keyboard will happily tell us that key number 102 has been pressed or key number 96 has been pressed. What it will not tell us is what the user wants when key 96 is pressed. That depends on the language of the keyboard, etc. Uh, mapping role scan codes to actual symbols or characters is very, very hard. If you're a stupid American, sorry, it's easy. But if you have a language which has more special characters, it becomes harder and harder. Uh, luckily, this is a solved problem. The X people had this problem for a long time and then they invented something called XKB, the, the X keyboard extensions. And there is a large database which describes all the possible keyboards all the different countries have. And we are just reusing that in Wayland. So enter lib XKB common, we have factored out all the common bits of XKB which we want to use in Wayland 2 into another library. And that this is a solved problem. But without Linux can be common, it would be a very hard problem. Mice are actually genuinely easy, because they're just relative devices with a number of buttons done, except for finding a good acceleration curve. Right, if you, there have been some experiments with user studies with just not applying any acceleration or applying a linear acceleration. So for each Mickey you move the mouse cursor two pixels or three pixels, but it will be constant, so you just multiply it. Uh, users don't like that. They want a non-linear acceleration curve. They want if it moves slow to go really slow, and then if they move faster to 
somewhat logarithmically accelerate. Um, Windows 7 and OS X have different curves. And if you talk to people, some people like the OS X curves better, and some people like the Windows 7 curves better. And then we're not even talking about the whole initial problem that we don't even know the physical unit of the events coming out of the mouse. And then on the other side, there's the problem of the DPI of the screen. Right? Because a user, when he moves the mouse, he doesn't want to move x pixels on the screen, he wants to move x millimeters. But then you need to know the DPI of the screen. But what if he has a high DPI laptop screen and a low DPI external monitor? Etc. So um, we have decided to fix this last part by just not caring about monitor DPI. If you have a high DPI monitor and you want to move faster, you just go to the preferences and move the slider to faster. Because it's an unsolvable problem otherwise, or very, very hard. And sometimes simple solutions are the best. Uh, the next type of input devices is touchpads. I already sort of told you that touchpads are, are a bit hard. Touchpads are absolute devices. Right? Your finger is in a location, you get coordinates from the touchpad where your finger is. But everyone expects them to use them as a mouse, and a mouse is a relative device. Which means we need to do translation. Uh, so Xorg got this driver called XF86 Input Synaptics, which did this. And this was all written around the concept that a touchpad would report one finger coordinate. And then came multi-touch touchpads. And we had to hack support for multi-touch into XF86 synaptics. That was really bolded onto the side. It's like taking a very small car, a Nissan Micra or something, and putting a, an engine for a big truck in it. It just doesn't work. It's really ugly. It's, it's, it's gone us through the last few years. But we're not really happy about it, and some users also are not really happy about it. Uh, basically, it turned the driver into a big ugly hack. So for lip input, we've thrown away all the code we had, and we are tracking individual finger positions. If you have a single old single touch touchpad, we just track one finger position, but we use the same new multi-touch code. Uh, do you does anyone know what I, what I mean when I say clickpad? Uh, with a click pad, you, uh, what I do is, if I know I want to do a select text, I put my finger on the bottom right area, which is the area where you need to click to get a, uh, oh, sorry, bottom left area, to get a left click, and I leave my finger there. But the way synaptics work, because we only track one finger, the initial finger is the finger we track. So in synaptic, if I rest my finger in the area where I want to click later on, and I try to move the cursor, it won't work. I first need to remove my finger from the area where I'm going to click. Then with my other finger move and then lift that, lift that finger. There can really be only one finger down with synaptics where it starts acting up. That's no longer a problem with lip input, which is also one of the reasons why we want to move even the X11 input to lip input in uh, Fedora 22. Um, the next type of Input devices you may be interested in are graphics tablets. We call them graphics tablets, so people don't think I'm talking about an iPad. What we mean is drawing tablets, uh, like Wacom, for example. Uh, these are not yet supported, but we're working on them. And we have, uh, especially Stefan Chandler Paul is working on it. Uh, we, uh, my colleague Peter Hunter has a Gitree available with all his patches integrated. and. The lib input side is sort of finished. Currently we're working on the Wayland protocol, we're hashing out the Wayland protocol. And we're waiting with actually publishing the lib input side until the Wayland protocol is set in stone, so the two are well matched. Right, because the idea of lib input is to make it easy to add support for this also to a compositor. So for now, when it comes to uh, the tablet stuff, we're focusing on the Wayland protocol. 
uh, a bit of a surprise she maybe I think I already put it on the table of contents earlier on gaming gaming is an issue with input and I'm not talking about game pads or force feedback devices or joysticks we don't care about all those those are not handled by the display server game engines can just directly open the evdev devices from the kernel and deal with that but the devices which we do care about are also a problem um, gaming has special demands when it comes to input especially when it comes to to mouse events uh, the problem is, this is a problem which X11 also has. That in a game like uh, Quake, you can use your mouse to look around, but you can look around 360 degrees and actually keep looking around in 720 degrees, etc. So you can pick it up and keep moving. But in a windowing system, which X11 and Wayland ultimately are, you usually don't get relative mouse events, you get a pointer where the uh, coordinates, where the pointer is over your window. Which means that you hit a wall, right? The pointer moves out of the window, or if it cannot move out of the window because you grabbed the pointer, as it's called in X11, it will hit a wall and it will stop moving. So, you, so in Quake, you can look like this, and then you hit a wall and you can no longer look further in that direction. In X11, this problem is fixed, uh, not by X11, but by the game developers. X has a call called Warp Pointer. Where basically, as an application, you can say, pick up the mouse pointer and drop it over here on the screen. And what they do is, every frame they put the mouse pointer in the center of their window. So it always has, can move. Um, we cannot do this in Wayland, because one of the principles in Wayland is that applications are not aware of each other, and they must not be allowed to influence each other. So grabbing the pointer is out of the question because then you could freeze other apps out of events or steal the pointer, we don't want that. Warping the pointer is out of the question, so these tricks will not work in x in, in Wayland. Um, that's a problem because if you break Quake, people become unhappy. Right? At least I assume that uh, some of you will not like it if they cannot play Quake on the Wayland. So what we need to do is we are going to add a raw mouse events mode. Uh, this will contain, instead of a coordinate, it will just give raw deltas. So every time we move the mouse, the application will get an event. And it will contain both unaccelerated and accelerated deltas, because as I said, getting the acceleration curve right is hard. So a lot of game engines will opt to just use the acceleration setting, which is already present in the lower levels. But some games may want to do their own acceleration and they can get unaccelerated deltas. And this is a problem because if you can, get, can catch raw mouse events, what about security and application sandboxing and whatever? So we decided, and we discussed this with the SDL guys, the guys who are working for Valve now, that uh, we're going to add this when we have time to actually implement it. And uh, they will only get raw mouse events as long as their application has the focus. Right, just like you, even if the mouse is not over a window, but it has the keyboard focus, it will still get keyboard events. So as long as the application has that keyboard focus, it can also get raw mouse events. Um, next subject is not about input at all. Uh, I'm organizing a mini conference about Wayland. A mini conference is a plumbers concept. Plumber stands for the, the Linux plumbers conference which is a conference uh, which is being held in Dusseldorf this year and uh, so not too far away from here not really next door either but. and uh, Plumbers is uh, all about plumbing so it's about connecting the lower layers, integrating lower level stuff etc uh, which, which Wayland very much is a part of so I'm organizing a conference there and uh, various integration issues will be discussed there, and if any one of you has any issues which they think are interesting to discuss there, uh, send me an email with a proposal and, and travel, be prepared to travel to Dusseldorf and present your issue for discussion there. So if you have a topic which you want to see discussed, then you can come there. And don't expect to be able to give a talk for an hour. 
I think we have half a day for the mini-conference, and the intent is to have something like five minutes of an introduction for a topic, and then 30 minutes discussion-ish, depending on how much discussion is needed, etc. I promised I wouldn't be entertaining you for the full 45 minutes. So, uh, this was my presentation. Are there any questions? So, uh, for the games, um, you said uh, it, the game will receive the mouse events as long as it has the focus. And so, um, how does it work? Uh, um, I mean, is there still then a mouse pointer visible, uh, or how does the game get so to hide it? And uh, if, if I click where the mouse pointer is outside the game, will Wayland then switch the focus away from the game, or because I mean, some games also need the mouse clicks? So how exactly is this going to work? Or if you if you let the game prevent this, then how do I switch the focus away from the game? Can I even, um, uh, do you have an answer to this or? <laughs> uh, good questions. Hiding the mouse pointers will probably just be a matter of setting an invisible mouse part, right? The mouse cursor always is partly transparent, just set it fully transparent. Uh, that will only work as long as the cursor is over your window, so as soon as you move it out, it will become visible again. And if you click outside of your window, then yes, if you have uh, click to focus. But it will break some games, the, this kind of thing. Uh, that's, that's why usually you play games full screen. Right? Wayland has support for full screen. You, you full screen the game. And I mean, I have done a lot of game development, and even with old fashioned X11, it's using the mouse in window mode never really works well. I mean, what you then get is that if you actually want to leave, you need to press a magical key combination so the game knows it needs to ungrab the mouse, and it's just not pretty. We'll probably, we just probably will only support mouse input for games which need this scroll mode in full screen mode. We will support it in non full screen mode, but you will get the problems with you, so. And so that's not very great, but yeah, I mean, I understand the problem. Yeah, yeah but it, as I said before, it. Um, I will, uh, this is for something like like, uh, like Quake, right? You're not going to play Quake in a window or go to full screen. Yeah, well, I play all the games that allow it in a window because then I can keep an eye on IRC <laughs> on the other end of the <laughs> window. <laughs> yeah. I can see the problem, sort of ish. Yeah, and then there's, if, if there's time, there's another question, uh, which is, um. You said uh, you know that mm, there will be users who don't like that you uh, are going to r uh, remove most of the configuration stuff. So if you know that users won't like this, then why are you doing it anyway? <laughs> because we're rewriting the code from scratch and the code to handle the configuration, we're not removing them, we're not adding them in a new implementation. That's how you should see it. It's not that we're removing stuff, we're just not adding it to the new completely rewrite from scratch. Because if we add them, then it becomes again a giant pile of steaming, you know what. <laughs> uh, how do you deal with oddball input hardware, like rotary coders and things like that, that normally are not mice or tablets or touchpads or anything like that? We have invented something new, which I think we still must implement, which we call a button box. And anything which is really weird, uh, like there are some really old input devices, which I think have something to do with, with MIDI boxes, which uh, have a serial cable connection, and they're just a bunch of rotary knobs, which each has 10 positions. We call that a button box. And it will pretty much just give a general description to whoever uses it, like I have 10 devices which each have 10 positions and deal with it. Uh, so are hardware vendors working on uh, libinput together with you? Libinput talks EVDEV to the kernel and uh, hardware vendors EVDEV abstracts input devices to a level that hardware vendors don't need to care of whether XORC is laying on top or lip input or whatever. 
Uh, I and my colleague uh, Benjamin Tiswar are working together with hardware vendors like Synaptics and ALPS to get uh, support from them for things like new generation touchpads, etc. So yeah, most of them, uh, most hardware vendors do talk to us and help us to get their hardware supported at the kernel level. And once we're past the kernel level, we're sort of vendor agnostic because everything is abstracted by the EVDEV interface. Yeah, well, my point was mainly that if they are planning to some to develop something in future, so there is an or that you uh, will be prepared for it in lab input. Well, this laptop, which has this new touchpad, which not only has soft button areas, as we call them, so areas to emulate the mouse buttons at the bottom, but also at the top, was a complete surprise to us. Neither Lenovo nor Synaptics told us. Synaptics didn't tell us because they couldn't, because they had a contract with Lenovo that they couldn't say any, tell anyone, and Lenovo just didn't tell us. Uh, we have requested both of them kindly next time to give us a bit of a heads up. But if that will actually happen, uh, I don't know. And we are in contact with them, we are talking to them, but when it comes to roadmaps for future devices, which are really new in a way, so we need to have additional code support either at the curve or at higher levels for them, uh, we'll probably always be a bit behind the curve there. Because they're very afraid to be leaking out sensitive information which could give their competitive competitors an advantage that although in this case I think no one likes the new Lenovo solution so they don't need to worry that competitors will be copying it. But <laughs> Any more questions? And then we have lots of time to walk to the next room. No one? Okay, thanks for your time.